Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. Yeah, now I like to uh, start yet another small section. And this one is on numerical approximation of partial derivatives. So um, in this uh, small uh, session, yeah, I just give you maybe the motivation and the first uh, basic result, but maybe let me start with a small programming teaser um, that shows you that the problem is maybe not so trivial. So the teaser here is, Given a function, I would like to calculate the partial derivative of this function with respect to x at some given point. And I would like to have a numerical method yeah, that does this, that approximates the derivative. Well, you would say, okay, this is a trivial topic. I know I can use finite differences because this is actually how you define in the limit yeah, the partial derivative. So you know that this guy here is approximately evaluate the function at some shifted value, subtract the function at the original argument, unshifted argument, divide by the shift size. This is a numerical method to approximate the partial derivative. And maybe let me implement this for f being the exponential function. And let's take x0 being 0. Huh? Derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function. Exponential function evaluated at x0 is 1. Yeah? So actually, this is just 1. This. So let's have a new class. This is my finite difference experiments, I like to have a main method. Okay, and I define my x0, so this is my x0. And I would like to print the forward, this guy is called the forward finite difference approximation of, of the derivative of the exponential function at this x. And let's have a certain shift, yeah? So let's take a shift, uh, 0 0.01. So let's implement this method. So this variable here should be my, my shift. Yeah, I calculate the value upshifted. Uh, so this is the exponential function at x plus shift. I calculate the value unshifted. Okay, so this is the exponential function at x. I calculate the finite difference. So this is the value upshifted minus the unshifted value divided by the shift size. Okay. Um, I can calculate the analytic derivative. So the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function. So the analytic solution is just exponential x, and I can calculate the error. So the error is now my finite difference approximation minus the analytic derivative. Yeah, maybe I print the, uh, the results. So let's print our shift size. So this is my h. Yeah? So let's have some formatting here. So this is string format. Uh, this is printing my shift. Okay, and then I maybe I also like to print the solution we get, the finite difference approximation. So the finite difference approximation, so this guy is also have some formatting. Let's take uh, 5.3 floating point digits here. So this is my finite difference approximation. Okay, and let's print the error. Uh, so maybe let's have a 
tabulator here to have a bit more space. Let's print the error. That's it. <clears throat> okay, yeah, let's run this little experiment. Yeah, just want to be quick here. Yeah, if I take a 10 to the minus two shift, I get my final difference approximation is 1.005. Okay, the error is 005. Yeah, the error is just here, this guy minus one. Okay, so you see, I have at uh, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two, I have an error. Huh? So the true solution is exponential of zero is one. Huh? So you have some errors. Let's take a smaller shift. You see that maybe I should take a smaller shift. Let's take a smaller shift, 10 to the minus three. Yeah, 10 to the minus three, I get a five times 10 to the minus four. Uh, so approximately 10 to the minus three error. Uh, so I'm getting it a bit better. Clearly, smaller shift is good for us. Yeah? So let's take a really small shift. Let's take a 10 to the minus 16. Let's take a 10 to the minus 16. Okay, so that's strange. The approximation is zero. The error is, of course, minus one, yeah? Zero minus one, one should be the solution, is minus one. So this shift here is strangely not suitable. So the shift is too small. Okay, let's take 10 to the minus 15. Okay, this is, yeah, goes in the right direction, but it's actually the worst solution I have so far, yeah, if you ignore this guy. So the error is a 10 to the minus one. So at the first digit here with this small shift. Let's take maybe a 10 to the minus 13. Okay, so I get a seven times 10 to the minus four error. So this is maybe quite decent, but actually this guy is even better. So you see from this experiment, uh, a 10 to the minus 12, maybe as a last one, you see from this experiment that what the mathematical stuff here tells you, take a small shift to approximate your finite difference, yeah, doesn't hold in the computer. And some of you maybe already have a guess why this is the case. It's the case because of the stuff we had in our very first session on computer arithmetic. There are rounding errors at work here. And our section here on Numerical approximation of partial derivatives is a very nice section to see that you have to understand how the computer performs its calculations to create actually a good numerical approximation here for this partial derivative. Actually, in the end, we will calculate, and this is what we do then in the next session, we will calculate the optimal shift size and the optimal shift size will involve, uh, or roughly, a guess for the optimal shift size. This will involve knowledge on how the IEEE floating point numbers work. Okay, so that's a small teaser uh, here. So let's start uh, with an introduction. Yeah, so what I do is I have an algorithm here, a function V, uh, for example, my financial product, and this function takes some arguments, so x1 to xn, so I have v of these arguments, and I'm interested in now the partial derivative of my function v with respect to my arguments x1 and xn. And I would like to approximate this uh, numerically. The function v could be anything. Actually, the function v could be a huge black box, which is a Monte Carlo simulation of something. Yeah? So in the end, we will also differentiate Monte Carlo simulations where you have to be a little bit careful, but this is a separate topic. Motivation for from the application side, yeah? if you think about our application valuation of financial product, yeah, then my function V is the value of the financial product. And these parameters here, here are my model parameters. 
that enter into the valuation. So the initial value of the stock I observe today, the interest rate I use in the model, the sigma in the Black-Scholes model. So you have all these model parameters here that influence the value of the financial derivative. So you can ask yourself, how does the value change if the model parameter changes? This is calculating a partial derivative. And there's a very important link here in the application. Risk neutral valuation is defined by this expectation under the equivalent martingale measure. But what is behind all this is the ability to construct the replication portfolio. This word risk neutral refers to the ability to neutralize the risk by replication. And this procedure, yeah, so this procedure is called hedging. So you have to determine the hedge products. Yeah? So you have to buy the replication portfolio on the market. And the partial derivative of the value with respect to the observed value of the stock, so the initial value of your model. So this guy here, this is actually the amount of stocks required in the self-financing replication portfolio. So you see, now that we have all our valuation framework, there is a natural motivation from the application to calculate the partial derivative of the value with respect to a parameter, yeah, the initial value of our model. These parameters, the, these can be many different parameters. So initial value of the stock, yeah, so this is just here the spot value. Yeah. So this is our S0. You could also have a cross-currency model. Yeah, then you have the initial value of the FX rate, it can be the interest rate. So if it is the interest rate in the Black Schultz model, it's just a single parameter R, but it can be very complicated. It can be the forward rates of an interest rate models. It can be the credit spread in a credit model or the implied volatility yeah, in your Black Schultz model. That's also just a single parameter. This is just the sigma. But in a more complicated model, this can be a family of parameters, a whole surface, or whatever. For us, yeah, this does not matter now. I just have a vector here of parameters, and I would like to calculate the partial derivative with respect to one of these parameters. And actually, for the numerical method, it is sufficient to just consider a single parameter. So I will consider now a single parameter x yeah, and I would like to calculate the partial derivative of a given function v with respect to x. Okay, so let's start and derive the different finite difference approximations of partial derivatives. So all these formulas actually come from this slide here. So I assume that my function here is sufficiently smooth. So I can differentiate the function with respect to a certain level. So it is in CK, maybe just assume it is in C infinity. Later, when we will differentiate Monte Carlo simulations, we have to be a little bit careful with this um, assumption yeah, and discuss this. But here for the derivation of the formulas, just assume that our valuation function is sufficiently smooth, say C infinity. Then I have a Taylor expansion. So for my given argument X, I consider now here a shift H and I have a Taylor expansion up to order n. So this is V at the shifted argument. X plus H is equal to V at the unshifted argument. And then comes the first derivative of V with respect to X times H and the second derivative of V 
with respect to x times h squared half and so on and so on. Yeah? So you have all these terms involving the derivatives of v, the partial derivatives of v with respect to x yeah, up to a certain order. And then you get a residual term. This is the n plus one partial derivative of v with respect to x evaluated at some intermediate point c that lies in the interval from x to x plus h. The idea is now that you select a derivative that you would like to approximate. For example, here the first derivative, you know, then select a certain order and then use these formulas for different values of h to cancel all the other terms. You know? For example, you can also approximate the first derivative with say, a certain order by just canceling all these other terms by taking suitable you know, such uh, equations that then are added or subtracted to cancel these terms. Well, that's the main idea. Yeah? You can also use it to derive formulas for the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on. So let's consider approximation of the first partial derivative here. So I use this Taylor expansion, yeah, this 25, I use it now with n equals one. So this means the v at the shifted argument x plus h is equal to the v at the unshifted argument plus the partial derivative of v times the shift plus my residual term. This is the Taylor expansion with n equals one. And I already moved the v of x to the other side. So now you can subtract this one, you know, move it also to the other side and divide by h. If you divide by h, actually this h squared here becomes an h and you have upshift value minus the unshifted value divided by the shift size h. This equals now your first derivative minus, well, actually it equals the first derivative plus the residual term, move the residual term to the other side. So I have a finite difference minus the second derivative of v at an intermediate point times h half. Yeah? So the h squared half divided by h. And you see that this is small if h is small. So this is now my approximation. This is my approximation for the first order partial derivative. This is my approximation error. You can do the same with, instead of using h, use minus h. So use this Taylor expansion 25, but now use minus h in place of h. So if you go back, you see that this will change here, this to a minus, but then I will also get a minus here, which means I flip the two. Uh, so it's a v of x minus v of x minus h. And yeah, it will change this minus here to a plus yeah, because this h here has changed. So if you use now this guy uh, with minus h instead of h, so you have that your partial derivative is given by the unshifted value minus the downshifted value divided by the shift size yeah, plus the residual term. So, and again, you have that this here is your approximation 
approximation for the partial derivative. And now I use a downshift. If T has the interpretation of time, yeah, then you could say that here you go forward x plus h, and here you go backward x minus h, and therefore sometimes these guys are called forward and backward finite differences. Next exercise. Let's try and use the 25 with n equals two. So let's use n equals two in the 25. So this means I have now the upshift value minus the unshifted value equals the first derivative times h plus the second derivative times h squared half. Okay, so this here is my shift. Plus a residual term that has now the third derivative times h to the power of three divided by six. And now I use this equation with h and with minus h. So if I plug in minus h, I have the downshifted value minus the v of x. This equals now the first derivative and the second derivative term. The first derivative term is multiplied with minus h, the second derivative term with h squared half, yeah, minus h squared is h squared, plus a residual term. And this residual term is now at a different intermediate point. This is at a xi minus. The xi plus comes from the interval x to x plus h, and the xi minus comes from the interval x minus h to x. Both come from the interval x minus h to x plus h. So now you can use actually these two equations to calculate the first an approximation for the first derivative. You can also use it for the second derivative that we can do later, because now you can uh, decide if you uh, subtract or add the two equations. Uh, so either this part here will cancel or this part here will cancel. We are interested here in the first order derivative. Uh, so what we do is we subtract the two equations, then this part here will cancel. Yeah? So you see, this is just the same. Second derivative times h squared half. Yeah? So this will cancel. So what I get, will get is I get actually two times the first derivative multiplied with h. Yeah? So I have an h minus minus h. So I get a first derivative times two times h here. And here, actually, if I subtract the two, I also see that these two guys here are canceling. So I just get the upshifted value minus the downshifted value. Upshifted value minus downshifted value on the left-hand side and on the other side, the first derivative. Then move the difference of the two residuals to the other side. The difference of the two residuals will actually make this guy here a plus. Yeah? So I have the residual with the C plus, third derivative with the C plus, plus the third derivative at C minus, and multiplied with an H to the power of three divided by six. So next step is I divide by 2h, yeah? this is the 2h actually I have here. I divide by 2h so that I get nothing here because I would like to have the first derivative. So I divide by 2h, I get the finite difference, upshift minus downshift divided by 2h, and the h to the power of three divided by six becomes an h to the power of two divided by 12. Yeah, you can make this residual term a bit nicer. Yeah, So this here is our residual term, our error term, because you have here actually the function evaluated at two different points by the mean value theorem. Actually, one half of this is the value of the function at some other intermediate point. 
Okay, so we have some other intermediate point here. So you can rewrite this residual term as third derivative at some xi times h squared divided by six. So summary is I have now a very nice approximation for my partial derivative that involves an upshift and downshift. And the error is of order two. So if I choose a small h, this guy is yeah much better than this guy, yeah, which has here just order one. Okay, so you see by using more and more points, you can improve the approximation order. Huh? So let's uh, conclude and let's summary, summarize. Yeah, so you see how the game goes on. So we have different approximation methods. There's the forward finite difference. There's the backward finite difference. And there's the central finite difference. So upshift minus value is called the forward finite difference. So below in the picture, it is the blue section. Value minus downshift is the backward finite difference approximation. Below in the picture, the red section and upshift minus downshift gives you the central finite difference approximation, yeah, if you divide by 2h. So these guys have order h or order h squared approximation error. And now comes the warning for my teaser. This lemma suggests that we should choose h very small, yeah? as small as possible. And we have a numerical experiment. So the following numerical experiment illustrates that actually this is not true, that we have to be careful. There is a region where we should get not smaller. So this is the teaser I did, yeah? the finite difference approximation of exponential x at zero. And I will have a more in-depth look at this in the coding session. Uh, where we analyze actually what is going on, where is the danger, dangerous uh, region, yeah? where are the problems starting. And then we will also make a few analytic calculations that tells us, okay, what is actually a good shift size? We will do this in the next session. That was it for today. This will be a nice one. Okay.